Hello and welcome to Shady Grove Radio. I'm Dan Loggins, and we are talking to Stan and Denise Sachs from Shady Grove Church. Hi, guys. Hey, how's it going? We're talking to, we're speaking right now from a very special place. Tell tell the folks where we are. Well, we're sitting in my kitchen, Dan, here in Oak Ridge. (laughs) It's an excellent place to be. It it is. It's a good place to finally be after a long journey getting here. Yeah, you guys have been wandering around the county, haven't you? Or North Carolina, at least. (laughs) For the last, yeah, for about the last 10 months or so. Okay. And you finally settled down here, and you got your house built, and it's beautiful. It is beautiful here. We're, We're real blessed to be here. Now, we were just talking before we came on the air about missions and how you got involved in that. You met at North Carolina State. And came to Christ sometime after that, recommitted your life to Christ. And Stan, you started telling me about something that happened at choir practice at Shady Grove one time. Was that 1989? No, this was more like 1999 when uh, Denise was part of the choir. I was not. Um, Nobody wants to hear me (laughs) sing, per se. But she came home from choir practice, and and she said, Hey, uh, they're having a, a mission trip to Costa Rica. And I said, well, that's, that sounds nice. And she said, well, I think we should go. And I said, I'm sorry? She goes, I think we should go. And I said, well, well why? I said, why would we, what would we do there? I said, uh, you took German in high school. Do you know any Spanish? Well, no, she said, but I still think we should go. So I gave her the answer that, you know, people give sometimes when they want to stop a discussion. I said, well, let me pray about it. And did you? Oh, I did. <laughs> and, and, and God kept telling me that I should listen to my wife and we should go. And it was, uh, it was a life-changing experience uh, for us as a family. Well, t- Denise, tell me what happened at choir practice. Wait so, a minute. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. You're not supposed to get called to missions in choir practice. Well, I had heard about George Gasperson, who was there uh, at Shady Grove at that time, was talking about um, short-term mission trip. And I don't know what it was, but it just suddenly just started tugging at my heart. And, and that's when I came home and told Stan that we should go. Um, his response was not exactly what I would thought it would have been, but his response after that trip, uh, as he said, for both of us was, was truly life-changing. What did, what did you expect him to say? Well, probably the, the answer that, that he gave me gave? is like, let me pray about it. Was this, was this out of character for Denise at that time for her to come home and say, let's go to, here's, wh- here's where I'm going with this, is knowing you guys the way I do, to hear that side of the story seems so different from the people I know. But, well, well, like I said, Dan, it was life-changing. And so, yeah, we, it was... Uh, not that Denise wouldn't suggest that we do something, but, uh, but I think from a missions perspective, this was our first encounter with it. It was. And really, as he said, one of the things that um, we were there for a week. We didn't know what we were going to do exactly, weren't sure, um, but I just felt like we were supposed to go. And so the same guy who was like, had his passport on him, had his exit tax in his pocket, ready to get out of there, even as we were entering the country, on our way back home after this mission trip, sitting on the plane, he is crying his eyes out. That would, I, that would be Stan. That would be Stan. He's, he's crying his eyes out, and I'm looking at him, and I'm saying, what's wrong? He said, I'm never coming back. And I said, what do you mean you're never coming back? He said, because it's too hard to leave. He had grown that attached to all of the people and the work, and that was God's beginning work in both of us towards missions. You know, it, and that was something you would have had no prior to her coming home from choir practice. If somebody said, Stan, you're going to go on a mission trip, and you're going to be in tears when you come back because your heart's broken, you have to leave— I mean, that's only a change that God can do in a person, isn't it? Absolutely, Dan. I, I would not have, I, I probably would have, any, anybody else that would have suggested that to me about going on a mission trip, I probably would have just blown it off. So, so what happened after that? You guys, you came back, and obviously you did go back. We, we did. We went back the following, the following year with uh, almost the same 
group, but we had some additions. It was a little bit bigger team, and we were working, doing construction. We were helping to build a, a church there and uh, a ministry center. And uh, we, just, we just really felt like God was calling us into a, a longer term of service. And we came back, and we were just really unsettled. Best word I know is just unsettled. And we, we couldn't even hardly tell people about our experience. We would just break down and just start crying. And so we just really began praying, and we began talking about maybe going for a longer term of service than a week. And we heard about these short-term um, trips that could go beyond go a net. week. Go net. Go net yeah, volunteers. Right, yeah. And it was anywhere from six months to 18 months that you could go and serve. And so we, we really started exploring that and praying about it. But we also knew we had businesses back here, and we also had two children at the time. Oh, yeah. Can we, let's pause for a second. That's right, because we were talking about you, each of you own a business, owned a business, or own, ran a business then, Correct. plus kids. Correct. And, and a home. And uh, so we had a lot of uh, responsibilities and obligations, but we still had this call on our hearts. So we um, did our exploring, and we actually took the kids December of 2000, and we took them for a short trip to kind of explore and see what their experience was like. We went and stayed with some friends that we had met there and that we'd become very close with. And uh, that was when God gave us some confirmation, actually through our kids, and some things that happened. And one of them was what I call the first miracle, and that was with Ashley. Um, One of the times that we got together with a small group in their home, and we were sharing, and we were having worship music, and then Bible reading, and afterwards, fellowship time. Well, during this time where we are singing, and we're praising the Lord, and we're also praying, I'm praying, and I'm saying, God, if this is where you want us, then it's not just Stan and I you're calling. You're calling our kids, too. So will you somehow confirm to them? Now, Ashley was first grade, right? Mm -hmm. So she was a first grader, and I'm just praying. And the Holy Spirit was definitely meeting with us in this um, worship time and this gathering. And so after the worship time, and we were heading outside for our fellowship and doing a little grilling out there at this home, uh, Ashley literally came up to me, and she started tugging me on the sleeve, and she said, Mom, I didn't understand any of that stuff in my head because it was all in Spanish, but I did understand it in my heart. And that was confirmation. The Holy Spirit oh, had wow. spoken to her. Yeah. Wow. That so, was the first miracle. <laughs> so, then, so then we, that was in December, so we got in touch with the folks at headquarters, went to Indianapolis for missionary training in February, where we learned something important. We were hoping to go at the end of the school year at, in June of 2001, but we learned that it was going to take between six, no, six to 12 months or more to raise support to go because it, you have to have all that money raised before you can go on the mission field. And so uh, we were at a, a sponsor's house, I guess, there in Indianapolis, the fellow there that was, uh, or their family that was sheltering us while we were there. And they, and I, and I got up in the morning and I thought, and I was talking to him a little bit, the husband, and I said, you know, I said, wait a minute, this is not my problem. This is complete, I'm, I'm up all night think, thinking about how this is going to happen. And, and I said, this is not my problem. This is, this is God. This is God's problem to work out for us. And so was it 11 weeks, 11 weeks later, all of our support had been raised. 11 weeks. How was that raised? Well, our what? church, Shady Grove, supported us tremendously. Um, but there were a lot of folks... Uh, from a lot of different denominations that that helped that helped us that helped us, we uh, Pastor Wes Brown got us some speaking engagements at different churches at different conferences. Um, we even got support from the Nazarene Church, the Methodist Church, the Catholic Church, a Quaker church that my Quaker uncle church. was <laughs> was I mean, pastoring. Was, they did a they did a huge fundraiser for us, and uh, and so it all it all transpired. And I mean, it all passed in a very quick quick uh, fashion. So get, that was miracle number two. In 11 weeks. In 11, 11 weeks. weeks versus right. the 6 to 12 months now, that normally it would take. This was, you said, was that June of 2001? 2001. 2001. Well, September of 2001. Were you there then? We were. We were. We were in another country when 
9-11 hit here in this country. So what was that day like? It was unsettling. <laughs> chaotic. Was chaotic. It was... Our Spanish was terrible, and there we're trying to look at the news uh, that was coming on, which was giving us all kinds of conflicting reports. And, of course, we're trying to interpret it. We were actually in language school at that time, and we all went out to the terrace, and we're looking at the, um, the television screen, and we're seeing these pictures, and we're, you know, like we're watching a movie. Like, and this is not real. And this you're is not hearing, really happening. you're hearing Spanish language. We're hearing Spanish language, so we're not understanding it very well. And, you know, we're hearing the White House is destroyed, the Capitol's destroyed, just on and on and on were the reports we were getting. And we weren't afraid for us, but we were so concerned about our family and everybody back here. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I guess... I don't want to be trivial, but that blew over. I mean, you found out eventually what was going on. We right? did. And you stayed there. We did. We stayed, we stayed uh, in Costa Rica. And uh, we were working with, uh, with a, uh, one of our churches there. And uh, in, um, with Pastor Julio and uh, his wife, uh, Lorena. And their family, and uh, it was in a place called Heredia. And we actually, uh, uh, they wanted us to teach a, a Sunday school class for adolescents. We, remember, our Spanish was very rudimentary at that time. <laughs> we're going to teach. So we're, <laughs> so we're asking them, well, do you have some materials? Or, you, you know, what, 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 what do you use for resources? And, and, you know, the answer we got was, oh, brother, you know, we get our, our word from God in the Bible. <laughs> And so we had to come up with stuff to to teach these kids. But we did uh, some. Well, Denise did mostly, but drama and mime, and and other things. So we were able to do a lot of outreach and evangelism with the with the kids there in Costa Rica, and it was uh, it was a lot of uh, fun. But God really blessed that. Did too. you work with the kids the whole time you were there, or yes? That's part of what we did. The other. Other things that we did was we worked with teams that were coming down from the States uh, and that, that were going to be working at various places, and we would help them. And we, by that point, our Spanish was a little bit better, so we could help do some translation and things like that. Did um, you see... Tell me about the lives that got changed. Tell me a story or two. Um, there, were a lot, there were a lot of them, Dan. There were yeah. so many. Uh, we could go on, but multiple mission trips... One outreach that I remember, we went to this very remote com uh, community mm. called Copa Vega. It was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was somewhere about two hours down a dirt road <laughs> before you get there. And we set up um, a, a point to bring this drama that we had, that the, the students had learned, that we taught them. And we could teach it to them because there wasn't a lot of language involved. There was drama. And so we could teach that to them. And then Pastor Julio brought the message, an evangelistic message. And we had people that were just flocking there afterwards to receive Christ after this mime drama that was called The Cage. And it was just about the freedom that Christ brought. And he brought the message that coincided. And afterwards, just a number of people just weeping and impacted by this drama and this message and, you know, praying to receive Christ. And that was just one of the events that we got to be a part of. And, of course, the Vacation Bible School, which always has an impact, not just on the kids, but also the adults that are there. To go to, go to a foreign country and take your kids and all of that, I mean, that's a, that's a big step. It's funny, when you said two hours down a dirt road, my mind immediately went to Guyana and Jim Jones and all of that. <laughs> I think it was a two-hour dirt road ride out to, to that area, but it's a, uh, and Co Costa Rica I know is not, that's not a Central, it's not a, a Central America unstable type no, country. Really, no, it's not. It, it's, it's not, it's not unstable. They, um, they are the richest country in Central America, but, it, but they're still a third world country. Still, you're, there, you're not in the United States. Did you ever have a moment when you're down there with your kids and you're thinking, "Man, why are we here?" You know what? what how's this going to? We were too busy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we were so busy, and we did. I mean, we did prison ministry. Um, we translated after 
you know, we'd been there a while, like Stan said, he went with one of our full-time missionaries to Panama, and he can tell you some stories about that. I went with his wife to Nicaragua, and we were serving as translators for medical mission trips going up to Nicaragua. Nicaragua is a much different situation, very war-torn, very impoverished, and we were planning on taking um, this medical mission team from Wisconsin, I believe it was, and we were planning on five days of medical missions, uh, really just going into some very remote, remote rural areas and trying to provide some basic medical care. Well, day one, uh, we get there and we we see a lot of different people, and it's things like headaches and dehydration and minor infections. They don't go to the CVS and go buy the antibiotics or go buy whatever. They don't. They have no resources. Parasites. We were deworming people. I mean, I do that as a veterinarian. But they were, at first time, I was embarrassed to ask them. And later, I was like, hey, we're going to give you some dewormer. And they're like, oh, cool, that'd be great. And um, so day two, we get to this place, and people have walked there. They've been waiting for hours. There are no less than 1,000 people. I'm looking at our supplies laid out on the, the tables. And Danita, which was the missionary I was working with, looks at me and we're like, boy, we won't have enough for the rest of the trip. What are we going to do? And I said, we need to go pray. <laughs> we need to go pray like the fishes and the loaves. And we literally went in a back room and we just started praying. We said, God, you got to multiply it. There's so much need. And we've got three more days of, of uh, medical missions that we've got to be doing. And we started praying. And not only did we see all 1,000 people there, we did have enough supplies for the following three days, but looking at the table, there's no way. God multiplied it. I know for a fact that was another miracle. And we had leftovers to leave the Nicaraguan. Oh, doctors. wow. God worked a miracle because literally there's no way we would have met the needs with the amount of material that we had. So uh, we're talking with Stan and Denise Sachs, Pastor Denise at Shady Grove, and Stan and Denise uh, with their kids have been in Shady Grove for a good many years, but Costa Rica is not the only place that you've been. Tell me some others. Well, we, uh, in 2009... Uh, we, uh, we went to, uh, we went to Ecuador on a sort of an exploratory trip to see if we could, could plug in there. And we did, and we took two other trips back there to help build a ministry center high in the uh, Andes mountains in uh, a, a in structure, Ecuador. a building, an actual building. Yeah. An actual building. They were meeting in a big blue tent on a concrete slab and, uh, they had a church, uh, group of probably, uh, uh, maybe about 70, uh, folks. Uh, most of them were uh, 25 and younger. They were young. It was a young congregation, wow. a, lot of, a lot of youth. And so uh, we were able to plug in there. We helped to get that, that building constructed. Um, it's interesting, uh, Steve uh, Gray uh, and I had talked for years about the possibly going to Cuba sometime, and the doors were always always closed to us. And so I got a phone call uh, in January, I think it was, of 2012, from uh, <clears throat> Rick West, who was our, he was our boss in Costa Rica, and he's a missionary with Global Partners. He was till he retired. And he called and he said, hey, uh, I need a, a survey and instrument of some kind. And I said, okay. I said, what are you looking for? And he said, well, I need a transit to lay out a building with. And I said, okay. I said, well, let me see what I can find. So I found him one, and I sent it to him. And uh, he... And he called me a, a couple of weeks later, and he said, uh, hey, uh, thanks a lot for sending that uh, instrument here. He says, but well, what I really need is I need somebody to come down here to Cuba and lay out a building for us. And I was like, okay, okay, <laughs> all right. So I said, let me, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So at Sunday school, I saw Steve, and I said, uh, I said, Steve, they're needing some folks to go to Cuba to help lay out a building down there. He said, when do we leave? And so uh, we went, uh, Steve and Tony Parsons and I went with Rick in August of 2012 uh, to a youth. Uh, Tony spoke at their youth, their national youth conference in Cuba. And where uh, kids uh, rode in the back of a truck for six or eight hours to get to this, uh, to this youth conference, a three-day conference. We were there. We helped. Uh, we did a, 
a rough layout on the on the building. Um, there was a a service the last night we were there. They uh, they uh, prayed over the ground, and I remember thinking at the time, God is going to take a miracle to raise an actual building here because of the difficulty with supply chain and who controls the materials. It's a communist how, country. It's a communist country. And so how do you, how does that even work? Even if you have the money, you can't necessarily buy it. And they certainly didn't have the money. So we, we, uh, we did a rough uh, layout of the building. Uh, we left with the idea we were going to go back uh, in the uh, January of 20, I guess, 2013. So we did. We, we went back. We sent teams. We worked with the El Camino Church down in uh, High Point uh, there. And uh, we sent three teams back to back to back, got the foundations in. And we kept going back until uh, 2016 when the project was was completed. How many times have you been to Cuba? Uh, eight, I believe, at last count. I remember my mother was attending Shady Grove, and I was going to another church. And I remember her telling me, we're sending a mission team to Cuba. And I said, you're not going to Cuba. Nobody goes to Cuba. You know, if you ever get to Cuba, you're not getting out. <laughs> well, it is the only country that I've ever been to where you have to go through a metal detector on your way into the country. They don't want you bringing, they don't want you bringing anything in, obviously. They don't want you to bring anything in. So it, it was great. We've been there and we're able to do, uh, to do a lot of, not only build the, construct the building, but we also were able to do ministry work there and, and got connected with a lot of, a lot of folks that we, uh, that we are still, uh, Still in contact with uh, today. So the the tell me the historic part of that that you right. So told me earlier. what we found is that uh, this was the first uh, the first new church that was permitted to be constructed since uh, Fidel Castro took over in 1959. Um, and what was I guess interesting is they got their permit or they got approved to get a permit to build and it took eight years to actually receive it once they were approved to actually get the permit. Wow. And it's so, not business as usual down there, is uh, it? No, it's, it's not. But it seems like it's God as usual. You know, I, God moved there in the hearts of lots and lots of people and, and um, the door was open. It's not open now, but it was open for a time. And, I think that uh, that country won't ever be the same for the for what God has done there. Now, I remember all the trips and the names of the people who went. My youngest son Elijah <laughs> right. went. Right. And when he said he was going, I didn't say this to him, but I'm thinking, why? You know, why? Why would? Why are you going to Cuba? Um, it was, but it was the people he was around. It was you, it was Tony Parsons. It was some of the others that went on this trip. And, uh, I think it was life changing for him. He came back. It's funny. He came back with three things. He came back with coffee, cigars, and some unbelievable stories. And I think he, he, he's often referred, uh, back to that time in Cuba over the years when he and I would talk. And it sounds like it was just a, it, it's like, confirm or deny this, it's like when you, you think you're going there to help them, oh, but, Dan. but it's, it, you, you have it completely backwards, maybe. You, that's the thing that I think that is the biggest impact. This is why we're so passionate about getting people to go on a short-term mission trip, to let them see how big God is, and to let them see how... Um, how their perspective can change. And they do. We do. We think we're going to go and be a blessing to people. And we are. Don't get me wrong. I think that we've been a blessing to people on the trips that we've been on. But I think that we're, we receive at least double portion of blessing uh, back from them. Absolutely. And, and so, so what, I'm, when we just have a few minutes left, we're going we're gonna to have to wrap this up. And I do want to record another one with you guys, and there's a, a dozen different subjects we could cover. But what's the status now? 
on, on the mission trips because it seems like things are shut down. Well, yeah. things are shut down. We've actually had, uh, we were planning on going to um, Cuba again, and that got, you know, that got canceled. Then we had, we were going to do a backup trip to go to Haiti, and then basically that was a no travel to Haiti. There was so much unrest there. Uh, then we were planning to go to Guyana, and uh, Guyana was canceled because of the whole COVID situation. And so, unfortunately, now that's really where we are. We're kind of on hold. Um, but I still feel like locally there are things that we can be doing, and we have been doing. We've been partnering with a few other churches that um, are doing some outreach. And so maybe those overseas trips will be on hold for a little bit, but not forever. And so uh, God still has work to do oh, over in those places. Absolutely. And in people here who, who should be serving. Absolutely. Now, if you're, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, well, I don't have time to do this, you guys both left businesses behind. We did. And we it did. fell apart, right? Nope. No. God bless that, too. <laughs> he did. He, he, we actually had somebody who said, I can't support you for the, the year you're gone financially, but I can mow your grass at your house for the year you're gone. Oh, wow. Just small things like that. That was the details. God worked out huge. every detail. So if every so, detail. somebody doesn't have time, they, it can, God can work through that. What about the money? The money, you know... Um, we, uh, we didn't get paid while we were gone because we needed that money to stay in the business and we weren't really doing anything. So, but, but if but, somebody says, I don't have the money to go on, no, God will provide God's the money. That's the least of your problems. <laughs> That's that the is, least. That is the least of your problems. You know, the, the biggest thing is, is having a heart that'll say yes. What about the person who would say, I'm not, I don't do construction, you know, I'm not a preacher, I, there's, not, I, there's nothing really there I could do. I need, God I'll, took a veterinarian and a surveyor for a year to another country, and we served in all sort of ways that we never imagined because God enabled. So, I, yeah, we, we uh, when I got back from Panama on a trip when we were living in Costa Rica, I was telling Pastor Julio that I had to give a sermon while I was there in Panama. And he said, well, you know, we were thinking that one of you should do the sermon on Easter Sunday. We, we told him how important Easter Sunday was here in the U.S., right? Not as much there because of the Catholic background. How it should be important everywhere, but that's <laughs> beside the point. But Denise... Who I'm still translating in my head what he said. Now, Denise is a little faster at that than I am. And she said, Stan will be happy to do it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah. And so you spoke on Easter Sunday? I did. In Spanish. In Spanish. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, that was the most excruciating uh, experience, I think, of my life in many ways. <laughs> well, following Christ and answering whatever call he gives you, is never boring. Is uh, uh, no, it's never boring. Absolutely never not. Boring. It's never boring. <laughs> never boring. So what's the future of, of missions through Shady Grove? It's, it, it, it has been a very active, very uh, dynamic thing. A lot of people participating. What's our future here? I, I think it's, I think the future for, for the mission is bright for Shady Grove because like you said, there are a lot of people that, that want to serve and that and that we have we have lots of avenues that we can serve uh we found that out through this whole the whole pandemic thing that there were a lot of things that we could do and participate in to help to help spread the gospel. if somebody's interested in serving from shady yes. grove how do they contact you uh, really through the church office or they can actually email me denise at shadygrove.net and i'd be happy to take their name we actually are Hoping to do um, helping out at the Weaver House, which is part of Greensboro Urban Ministry. They are in dire need of adults, people 16 and above, 18, actually, 18 and above, excuse me, um, to help serve meals to people who are um, kind of down on their luck and really re rely on Greensboro Urban Ministry to help supplement their meals. We're going to wrap this up here. Okay. And usually what I do at the end is I have my guest pray regarding the subject matter that we've, we've talked about. You both can pray. One of you can pray. It doesn't matter. Denise can. But, okay, <laughs> since you spoke at the Easter service in Panama, 
<laughs> she beat me to it. <laughs> she'll do the <laughs> she'll do the prayer, and I think maybe at, at least you should pray for people to answer the call because who would have thought at choir practice, you know, in I mean, nineteen ninety eight. I mean, would would define your life today because that's the way I see you guys mm -hmm. as missionaries. It, well, we are. <laughs> you know, um, what if you had had a cold and missed that choir practice yeah. or something? You know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, God maybe would have worked it out a different way, but God shows up in some of the most unusual places, and we hear a call from the most unusual situations, and you guys answered. And I just appreciate so much your witness through the years and the work you've done and the work you're continuing. You haven't retired yet, right? No. Yeah. So you're and, absolutely not. And Denise, of course, you're a pastor and on staff, and um, you're you're pursuing ordination. Am I? I am. I have about eight classes left to complete prior to ordination, which and was another thing. That's I just said yes, and I'm not really sure. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, God's got this. He's got. He's got the plans. I'm just following. We definitely need to talk more about that. So go ahead and lead us in prayer, okay. and we will finish up. Great. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we just counted a privilege to just be in your service and to follow you. And Lord, uh, I pray that even as people are listening to this, that maybe those that have been on the fence about serving or getting involved or just saying yes to you, Lord, would have the opportunity to say yes and just reap the great blessings that come out of obedience. Father, thank you for allowing us to say yes. And we just pray that the future of Shady Grove will be bright and that you will just give us a vision for where we are to serve because we know part of what we are to do is to go into all the world and share the gospel. May it be to your liking, Lord, in the way that we do that. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Stan and Denise, for having me uh, here in your in your home. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. And Pastor Denise and Reverend Stan, because <laughs> Billy Graham, I think, spoke in Los Angeles on an Easter Sunday, and he's well known for that, and you're well known for Panama Easter Sunday message there. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you for listening. Join us next week.